Good afternoon. On behalf of Veterans and Politics International, I want to thank you both for coming. Just to give you a brief overview of this process, the panel members will uh, be given 30 seconds to introduce ourselves. And then after that, each one of you will have uh, 45 seconds to introduce yourself. Please state your name and what exactly you're running for. Once we ask a question, you'll be given roughly one minute to respond. I won't be rude and cut you off, but if you can keep going on and on, then I will have to cut you off at some point. I also want you both to understand this is... This is an interview, it's not a debate, so neither one of you guys can ask each other questions. After that, each one of you will also be given 45 seconds uh, to give a concluding statement on why uh, people should support you and also why you're the best candidate. And then please give out your uh, campaign contact information. I will start by introducing myself. My name is Jim Jonas. I'm the director of Veterans of Politics, and I also co-host the podcast with Steve Sanson. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. My name is Gianno Amato. Been with Veterans and Politics for the last couple of years. Um, been here all my life, and I'm a local entrepreneur. I'm Robert Faust. I'd like to thank you both for being here. <clears throat> I'm a third-generation veteran. Uh, my grandfather was in World War I, my father was in World War II, and I fought in Vietnam. After the war, I managed to play 10 years of professional baseball. I authored two books that are now uh, available for sales. I also spent four years in federal penitentiary for drug smuggling. Okay, thank you. And now we'll go ahead and start with Will, if you want to give a 45 second introduction of yourself, and please make sure you state your name and what you're running for. Thank you. Will Rucker, and I'm running for State Assembly in District 13. I'm running because I believe Nevada deserves better. I'm running because I think that we can and we should do better. The things that I care most about are people. I am not a politician, I am a pastor. And what that means is that my faith informs everything that I do. My desire to love everyone and to ensure that everyone has a great quality of life is why I am running. My background is diverse and multifaceted. I grew up in the performing arts in Detroit, Michigan, and ended up in business, starting several businesses, and then wasn't fulfilled. So I moved into nonprofit work, and that's where I find myself now for the past eight years here in Nevada, I have been working to improve our education system, to improve our uh, justice system, to improve our way of life. And I think it's time to bring Nevada to 2022, not 1880. So uh, that's why I'm running and I look forward to your additional questions. Okay, thank you. Them? Yes, uh, my name is Vem Miller. I'm running for Assembly District 13 as a Republican candidate. I'm running because, uh, frankly, I, you know, five years ago, I would have never thought about running for office. I had no desire. It was not on my bucket list. But what's happening in this country is we are in a state of uh, war. It's not a violent war, but it's an ideological war. And what's happening is that uh, Marxism and tyranny have invaded our shores on every level of government, on every level of pop culture, on every level of media. And uh, frankly, this is the kind of thing that my folks and my grandparents escaped from. It gave me a fierce urgency to jump into not only this race, but to let my opinion, thoughts, uh, feelings and, uh, you know, be known through my work as a filmmaker uh, and to also jump in this race and try to push uh, this state and this country back in the right direction because we are way off uh, the rails right now. Okay, I'll start with the first question. Uh, the first question, it, it'll be for both of you. So last legislative session, Veterans and Politics, uh, we produced... Uh, proposed a bill that died in committee, and it, the bill is called Remove or Retain. So while it is state law in Nevada that all judges are elected, what ends up happening is that incumbent judges, but this bill only is talking about incumbents, not a challenging judge. So if an incumbent judge runs for re-election, okay, unopposed, so no one else is on the ballot but them, Current state law states that they automatically win that election. 
And one of the things that we've found out that there's a lot of these current sitting judges that people are afraid to oppose because most of them are attorneys and they're afraid of backlash from that judge. So they basically go unopposed. So what we did was we proposed a bill called remove or retain. So what happens is, is that that judge is still on the ballot. The voters get to decide, do we want to retain that judge or do we want to remove that judge? If remove gets more votes than retain, then what happens is that the uh, selection committee is opened up and anybody who wants to be a judge files the appropriate paperwork. It goes to the Judiciary Appointment Board. They select three of the best candidates and send that to the governor and then the governor selects who sits in that seat. Uh, I'll start with you, Will. Is that something you would be willing to sign on to, or is there issues you see with that bill? I actually think it's, it's a really, really good idea. And in my race, candidly, I was concerned about running for similar reasons. Running against those in law enforcement and in other professions can be a dangerous thing to do. And so I think that it's critical, specifically with judges, that we have individuals on the bench that are qualified, that are compassionate, and that are there for the right reasons. And so I don't think someone just because they've had a seat should automatically keep that seat. I do want to hear more about the bill before I would say yes, absolutely move forward with it as is. But I do like the spirit of it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. So I would definitely support that bill. Um, if, if, you, if it's OK, I'd like to add a few more things on top of what I what I believe is necessary to do. So I think the bill is really good because then you, you get rid of some of the issues of uh, essentially attorneys being intimidated of running against judges. Uh, on top of that, I think it's very important. You have uh, attorneys essentially funding uh, judges candidacies, and that is just uh, brewing with a conflict of interest. I think it, attorneys should not be allowed to provide financial support for judges that they're electing into office uh, because, again, there's an inherent conflict of interest there. Uh, and I do think further regulations, further laws are necessary in order to strengthen the retain or uh, and, and remove bill. Um, for example, I think uh, the committees that oversee judicial discipline you can't have a bunch of attorneys in that same pool that are overseeing judicial discipline. So I think it's imperative that we have uh, a third party, third party made up of citizens. I don't think you need to be an attorney to be able to oversee judges. So that's the my last point on that topic. OK, thanks, ma'am. Uh, Gianno. OK, so my first question is about transparency. Um, you know, so there's a lot of uh, uh, police officers that arrest people and they turn off their body cameras. Um, you know, they want to control a narrative, right? So how would you guys, what do you guys think about transparency? And would you oppose a bill or would you be for a bill that did not allow that, that officer to turn that damn body camera off no matter what? Um, Vam, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, no, uh, police officers should not be allowed to turn off their video cameras. 100% um, for transparency, including in the assembly, to be honest with you. I think committee meetings should be all live streamed. I think our ballot counting process during elections should be live streamed. I think everything should be about transparency. There is no reason for, and, and it happens with judges too, by the way. I just did a piece, uh, I did a documentary about a judge that turned off the camera inside court because one of the lawyers was essentially losing his court and doing a lot of things you shouldn't do in court, right? So I'm all for transparency. I was actually listening to the Stan Height interview earlier when you had asked that same question. Uh, if the camera's turned off, I really want to learn why that's happened and there should be punishment for somebody trying to conceal the truth. I think it's unacceptable for somebody to make a, essentially an executive decision to turn off a camera and conceal what's happening. There's, I do not see any scenario where that's permissible. Thanks. Could you repeat the question for me? So my question is, um, it has to do with transparency and it has to do with, uh, let, let's say officer involved shooting, for instance, um, where you, know, you, you have these citizens 
that are killed, right, by these officers. And if there's any way, okay, I mean, even a 1.0001% where the officer looks at, at, he could possibly be at fault, they're not going to release these videos for years to come, right? Um, would you support a bill or would you oppose a bill that would allow, um, uh, make the bill basically would would it would have to be struck structured in a certain way but it would basically be about um making sure that the officers that the da releases that video within 24 hours got you thank you so much so that's a, a important thing and when we had the george floyd murder i was part of really looking at what was happening in vegas because before george floyd we had byron williams and so i absolutely think the cameras need to be on 24 hours i do think may be a bit short for a turnaround time on releasing the tapes but we definitely need to look at how those tapes are obtained and the reason i say it's a short time is because you can't just release the raw footage there are privacy issues and things of that nature required so we have to be able to get them out quickly without a great expense to those requesting them and Absolutely. No, no reason for an officer to intentionally turn off their body cam. If their cam is off and something happens and it could be potentially negligent on the officer's behalf, then I do think there needs to be some, some sort of automatic release from duty at that point because it's just not likely that and the camera is going to just happen to turn off when they're at fault. So I do support the spirit of that as well and would like to make sure that we include all of the reasons um, these things might be taking time. Okay, perfect. My follow-up question to that is... Uh, you gonna let them respond or are you just good? No, didn't Vim already respond? Yeah, he, yeah, he already responded no, to that. Sorry. So you bring up, you, you bring up um, George um, Gomez, right? Was, was it uh, Gomez? Floyd. Floyd, no, 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 uh, Gomez here in, here in town. Okay. So, so anyways, uh, uh, Gomez, there, there was a, um, during the riots, there was an officer um, shot and his name was uh, Shane. Anyways, within one hour, I, I believe, right? Maybe within minutes, I, I forget what it was, but there was a citizen killed, okay? His name was George uh, Gomez, I believe. Now, do you think that that was, um, do you think they just they 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 it just happened to be within one hour of a citizen getting killed, or do you think it w it was payback? Me first. You first. Yeah. So I I don't know the, the particulars of that situation, and so what I would say is that's inexcusable. We we shouldn't have gotten to that point in the first place. And the reason that I'm running for assembly is I really want to restore community again. I want to have neighbors be neighborly again. We've gotten to a place where we can't even have a civil conversation, where even the very subject of who's in office can create division within families. And so we have to go back to the foundations of what made our nation great, which is the fact that we all came together and worked to create something that everyone could aspire to. Our nation has always been aspirational. And we've not yet reached the pinnacle of the promises that we made in our founding documents. So I think that sort of thing starts there. Law enforcement needs to be reformed from top to bottom. And the reason that it does is if you're in military, as you all know, you do tours of duty. Police officers don't do tours. They do careers. And so that trauma, that continued heightened state is always present. They never get a moment uh, off to actually process. So their, their rational thinking brain is not online. Their instinctual brain is online. So things like retaliation and violence are at the core. So I'm probably at my 45 seconds. Okay, Vim, um, and just to clear that up, okay? Um, so nobody should be shooting a police officer, right? Nobody should be shooting anybody. Um, and I believe if, if there was gonna be paybacks, it should have probably been on that person that shot the officer, right? Now, it, so his name was Jorge Gomez. Um, within, you know, I wanna say minutes, but within the first hour for sure, after Gomez got, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, after uh, Shane, got shot, which was the officer, there was an automatic retaliation, okay? And at first officers, you know, they, they I, I, I wanna say they um, 
shot off some some uh, smoke grenades. Okay, make sure nobody sees anything. Right, right after they shot that off, um, they said that he raised his weapon and they murdered him right there. They they killed him. Okay, um, transparency. Do you think they should have been allowed to you know not? Um, uh, do you think they should have been allowed to hide these cameras, or do you think they should have produced them right away? I, I, I think they should have produced them right away. I think transparency is key, uh, and across the board in everything in, in our government, transparency is key. Because if you you know conceal that sort of an event, and you and then you are tempted to conceal other sorts of events. So I think transparency is absolutely key in all aspects of government and policing. Okay, and do you think that was retaliation, or what do you think that was? I need to understand a little bit more about the details. I was trying to follow it along as you were explaining what happened. I mean, it does sound like retaliation, but that's just from what I'm gathering uh, what, from what you're saying. <laughs> so thank you for being here today. Um, in the school district, uh, teachers... You know, actually, I want to ask, first of all, uh, Vim, what religion are you and what politician, what, what political party? I'm, I'm a Christian and, and I'm running as a Republican. Okay, and Will? I'm a Christian and I'm running as a Democrat. As a Democrat. Okay. So, uh, do you think that uh, school teachers should be, uh, should be placed in the position of counselors um, to... Uh, modified the, or uh, identify the gender of students. In other words, a boy is a boy and a girl is a girl. But we have teachers that want to want to you know they want to make the other one the other way around. So what do you think about that? Should I go first? I think it's ridiculous, to be honest with you. I mean, teachers have a job. They have a specific training. I think it's their job to teach children. I think trying to identify somebody's gender when you're not qualified, when you don't have the education to do that. And also timing is key, too, because is, is the child 10 years old or is the child now within puberty and understanding of those topics a little bit more as they get older, or is he, you know, 15, 16, you know? So, I know I I don't think that's uh, in the in the job description of a teacher. Well, well, yeah. So I'm not aware of any teachers that are doing that. So I'll say that to to start. I work with the Clark County School District at the middle school and high school levels directly, and then I oversee programs that also are in the middle schools. And I've never heard of that happening in any of our schools. Uh, with the idea of gender. I think that it's important to understand that gender is a construct. And so we will say this is a boy's toy, this is a girl's toy, this is a boy's color, this is a girl's color. So we, we genderfy, to make up a word here, things that are, are not human or, or not alive. We, we genderfy inanimate objects. So gender is a matter of perspective and cultural. Uh, with that, I think it's critical that we understand that there is not just boy and girl. There's also intersex. There are individuals who are born with both sexual organs. They are a very small percentage of the population, but they do exist. And so to other that type of individual, I think is cruel and should not happen. I think the entire idea of this uh, gender issue within schools um, is, to, to quote my, my interview counterpart here, ridiculous. It's not an issue that kids need to uh, be indoctrinated with. They simply need to be able to explore and grow and become human. Uh, that's that's really where we need to be. The last thing I'll say about that is this issue has been polarized around the idea of transgender. And even going back to our indigenous peoples, there were more than two genders, there were six. And so this idea of being two spirit is something that is as ancient as time itself. And we need to allow people to be exactly who they are. I am not one that believes the government should be regulating how parents raise their children or how schools influence the children in a matter of gender issues. I think that we have too much uh, regulation in that way. Okay. So on that, uh, my next question, so since we transition to education, uh, you know, I hear this every election cycle, specifically from Republicans, that the Clark County School District is too big 
it needs to be broken up, okay? And then the Democrats always say, well, no, the Clark County School District is fine. It just doesn't have enough money. So my question to both of you is, which one is actually the case? I don't, me personally, I don't think the Clark County School District, uh, it's advantageous to break it up, and I'm going to say why. So we complain about uh, too many administrators and oversight in the Clark County School District. Okay. Well, if we break the Clark County School District up, right, now we have the Mesquite School District, we have the North Las Vegas School District, then we have the Las Vegas School District, then we have the Henderson School District, we have the Boulder City School District, we still have the Clark County School District, and then we have Moapa School District. So isn't that just creating more layers of bureaucracy? So, uh, I mean, are you in favor of splitting up the Clark County School District, either one of you? I wanted to make sure that I clarified my opinion on that. Ben, you want to go first? Sure, yeah. I'm, um, I'm all for splitting up the school district. Um, I think so. The school district, back when it was built uh, in 1956, the town was 56,000 in population. It's gone up 51 times in size uh, and has become greatly diversified. Uh, and we're literally bottom of the barrel if you count Puerto Rico. Joey Gilbert was making this point the other day. We're actually 51. So, I mean, it's broken. It's beyond broken. When something's that broken, it just there. It's not about making incremental fixes and it'll repair itself. It's like you literally have to rebuild it because it is absolutely beyond repair. Uh, and I think part of that is making uh, it more regional, making it more communal, getting the parents involved. I think parents are intimidated by going into this monolithic and frankly, you know, Marxist leaning school board and trying to have their voices be heard. So I think once you break it up into different small smaller communities, you get parents more involved. And what you ha what happens there is you create a level of competition because now if you have seven school districts and one of them is doing exceptionally well and, you know, they've come up with really groundbreaking ways of, you know, raising kids' grades and that sort of thing, the other six are going to be upset about that. They're going to want to compete with that. So I think in the spirit of competition, you could actually help to make the school districts, uh, these broken up school districts, a lot stronger. Uh, and and certain communities are going to do certain things, you know, with the influence of parents. And I, since we're so rock bottom, I just feel as though uh, there is nowhere to go but up. And I think you create this spirit of competition and you let them compete amongst each other. And I think it repairs itself. OK, thanks, man. Well, yeah, I, I think that this is a yes and answer for me. And what I mean by that is we should certainly look at how to create smaller pockets so that they're more manageable. I also agree with your point that you create additional bureaucracy, additional administrative cost when you have additional districts. I come from Michigan where every city had a district. And then we also had charter schools and private schools. I was fortunate enough to attend a private school in high school, and I came from a really good district. And the level of education at my private school was leaps and bounds above that I got in my public school. And my public school was one of the leading districts in the nation. So understanding that, I think we have to look at what is the goal that we're trying to achieve. The goal we're trying to achieve is to educate our kids. It takes funding to do that. We spend a little over $9,000 a pupil. That's not enough anywhere. And more money is not going to solve it if we keep the same approach. So we need to modernize our approach to education. We overtest, we overtax our teachers, and by overtax I mean over uh, we charge them to do twenty different things. So we need to evaluate from the ground up how we look at education, and we need to decide as a state why is it. We're 49th is what, what the, the number I have. Why is that? Well, what are the things that are causing that? And do we really want to change that? Or are we looking at population growth? Are we looking at inviting businesses in? What do we need to do to actually have a great school district? And I do not think that the answer is just breaking up the districts because you'll increase the disparity between those that have and those that have not. So, so how do you feel about uh, student loans? Yeah, do you think that student loans should be given to everybody? Grab me first. That's a good question. Uh, I do think student loans should be available uh, to people. Uh, other, unless 
you're financially so wealthy where you would not qualify. I think definitely people that are in need should have the opportunity to get student loans. And do you think they should be forgiven? That's a good question. Could I think on that one for a sec? I'll start with the, the last question and work backwards. If we're bailing out big business, we should bail out people. That's how I feel about that. With the issue of student loans, I think that it's a predatory system at this point. When I applied for student loans, it was super easy. I went through a little module online and signed a document saying I understood what I was doing and I got a student loan. And then fast forward a few years, won't say how many, I'm applying for a mortgage for the home that I am occupying, that I, that I already own, just trying to refinance. And because of my student loans, I didn't qualify to buy the house at a lower interest rate and a lower payment than I had because I have student loan debt. And so this entire system needs to be evaluated. My perspective is we need to think about this in a modern way. We're not, I'm not for just doing patchwork fixes to old problems. Let's reimagine a new way. Let's look at education as a whole and say that you know what, at this point, a bachelor's degree is what a high school diploma was 30 years ago. So everyone needs to be able to have access to a bachelor's degree. I think that higher education should be just part of the deal. It's an investment in our future and we should fund that. And so no one should have to take out a loan in order to get an education, period. If you want to go to Harvard or Yale, then that's different. Private institutions, you pay for that. There's still, you know, that freedom. And it's so important that everyone has equal access to the opportunity of education because the only way we can move forward as a state, as a nation, as a world is with an educated citizenry. I do think in some cases, it's just such a tough topic as a, to answer like a blanket answer on every single case because uh, it, it's, it's a tough one to answer. It really, I think it depends on the person's circumstance. There's got to be other criteria. I think just blanket forgiveness across the board uh, doesn't necessarily make sense to me, but a certain level of forgiveness does, and I do think it's, that it's got to be criteria-based. Okay, um, so my, my next question, um, we're going to take it off the, the subject of uh, schools right now, and it has to do with uh, the mudslinging, right? So I used to, I, I used to date a, a, a girl, and her parents come over, her whole family comes over one day, and uh, we just started dating. And, um, you know, we have a bunch of Mexican food out there, and they were like, oh, my God, this is so good. Who made it? She points at me, and she says... He made it. And I looked at her and I was like, no, I didn't. I said, we bought it. So the point I'm making is I wouldn't even go along with one lie. OK. And I think it's very dangerous for somebody not to only go along with one lie, but two lies, a thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand, whatever it is. Right. I think it's very dangerous. And uh, especially with um, right now, the situation going on with Russia, they were taught a tactic. OK. The tactic is mudslinging, right? And you, you, you get mud and you throw it against the wall, right? You throw it all over the wall. You got to take every single grain of that dirt that was thrown against the wall, right? And you need to investigate everything and nobody knows where the hell to turn to, right? So my question, uh, Vim, first, do you think the election was stolen? And if you do, uh, what evidence do you have to back it up? Okay, I could tell you. So my background is I'm, I'm uh, in film and TV production. I've been doing television shows and uh, other content for over 20 years. One of the things that I do as a part of that is investigative journalism, which I've done pretty much uh, just because I feel the need to reveal things and, you know, reveal lies. You know, and this this thirst actually started um, in early 2000s with the Iraq war and some of the lies that they're telling us about weapons of mass, mass destruction and that sort of thing. So I went through the voter rolls in this state myself, actually went over addresses uh, in mass and saw how votes were being delivered to locations that don't exist. Votes were being delivered to places like Alzheimer's facilities, storage units, commercial locations, all which is illegal, by the way, because you can't have Alzheimer's patients that are like on the verge of death, completely loss of memory voting. But nonetheless, they were voting somehow. This was making it to the system. There was 
was many duplicate votes. Uh, there was, I mean, it, the voter rolls are a mess here. They need to be audited. These ele electronic machines have to be done with. And so if you ask me from the evidence that I've seen here within this state, yes, I do believe there was definitely shenanigans. Uh, and there was about 80,000 votes that are very suspect. So I do believe in unison with what I've been hearing about other states, what's been going on, what's been revealed. I do believe that there was uh, uh, election fraud. Um, I do believe that this is part of a bigger issue, which is that if you've noticed under an America first president, we have a dollar 60 gasoline. Now it's under a more globalist minded president, we're uh, over $5. And so I do believe that there was issues with the 2020 election, yes. All right, Will. No, the election was not stolen. Uh, people voted and they selected the individual that they chose who's occupying the White House at this time. The idea of mudslinging is, is so important and the idea of shared reality is so important. When you have individuals who, because they feel a certain way, uh, think that that makes them qualified to do inspections and to make assertions about things in every realm, whether it's financial, whether it's voting registrations, whether it's, you name the, the subject, because they've done a little Googling, they think that they're educated enough to actually understand the data. I think we're in a dangerous place. I have a master's degree that uh, is in executive leadership, and I wouldn't dare try to analyze voter rolls with a master's education in that. Um, and I say that to say there's this, this, uh, this it's a principle called the Dunning-Kruger effect, where people that are uh, less well able think they're more able than they are because they don't know what they don't know. And so the experts have, unequivocally stated the election was fair. In fact, the previous White House said it was the safest, most fair election we've ever had. So I, I can't go along with any ideas that it was stolen, that there was mass voter fraud on any scale, uh, that people were voting twice, or that people that shouldn't have been voting should, uh, you know, vote it. Last thing I'll say on that is I'm not trying to go backwards. This is the year 2022. Why are we still trying to go to paper ballots? Number one, that's not environmentally friendly. It's inconvenient. It, it disenfranchises people who work. I'm, I'm friends with folks that work two and three jobs. I work two and three jobs. So it's it's hard to actually go out and vote. I, I saw a post on the internet today about the GOP saying opt out of mail-in ballots. To me, that's absolutely ridiculous. Why would you want to make it harder for anyone, especially your people, to vote? So mail-in ballots should certainly be a thing, but we need to go beyond mail. We need to do electronic voting. There's blockchain technology that allows us to vote from our uh, mobile devices. All right, sorry about that. We got to cut you off right there. Just one one statement. It's not even a question. I just I just want to state one thing um, about the mudslinging. I was talking about them. What what that is, is you take anything that anybody says, OK, anybody could do this. Right. But it's dangerous. OK. And we're not saying right. We don't have it right here in our face where we could guarantee that something was stolen, because if it was, yes, it would need to get reversed. Right. But what I'm saying is the mudslinging. You take anything, okay? The, you, you say, you know, like the 80,000 um, uh, fra fraudulent votes, right? And you could twist that, okay? Somebody could twist that. And then what you do is you twist it again. And then when they, when, when somebody, you know, is onto that, you twist it again, right? The dangerous part about that, fellas, is, you know, the, the, the situation that's going on where these other nations, and, you know, these other uh, uh, corrupt uh, uh, presidents and stuff like that from other countries, they caught on to this game. Right now, what do they do? We didn't kill all them, them innocent citizens in Ukraine. Uh, the United States set that up. It's a very dangerous game. And if that was your guys' children, we would I mean, you guys would be hurting. So imagine these poor, innocent people that are taking this mudslinging and they're twisting the shit out of it. Right. So it, it's a very dangerous game. That's just I just wanted to state that. OK, I have one last question. And this is just something um, that always frustrates me. And it's one of those things. Where I'm just going to be honest with both of you. When, when you guys get elected, it happens every single 
uh, election cycle, and it happens every legislative session. So the last legislative session in the state of Nevada, there was 185 NRS statutes passed in a 60-day time frame, which is follows the state constitution. In the first 58 days, three NRS statutes were passed. 182 statutes were passed in the last two days of session. So if elected, what will you two do to make sure that you push back on your peers to keep the train moving? Because the way I look at it, just from a number standpoint, I'm like, you could only pass three bills in 58 days, but 182 in the last two. So isn't that a waste of taxpayer dollars? Like, wh wh what were you doing the first 58 days? It doesn't seem that efficient to me. Uh, Will, I'll start with you. Measure twice, cut once. That's how I feel about it. Uh, I agree that it, it was kind of a, a bit of a rush towards the end to get things done. And I think it's required to, to set up and to revise and to revisit before you actually pass legislation. And then when you're in your last time, when, when you're at go time, you go. Um, what I will say that I will do when I'm elected is restore the spirit of collaboration. What I have seen, and even with my party in the majority, is we have not worked together for solutions. And so we have been in competition. Whose name can we get on this? Well, we're not even going to talk to them. We don't need their vote. I don't care if we need the vote or not. We should still ask for it. So we need to create a government that is solution focused, where we are collaborating. We identify the problems and not the politicians we're fighting. So we need to work together as problem solvers, as representatives of the greater uh, Nevada and, and, and fix things. So to, to, to succinctly answer your, your question there, I, I agree. Um, the, I think the solution, though, is to have more days available to create this legislation. Okay, thank you. Ben? Yeah, I mean, I could tell you what I would do in that sort of a situation. It depends. It's, it's all a strategy. It depends on who's voted in, uh, what kind of a balance there is between Democrats and Republicans. I have a lot of ideas that I think both Republicans and Democrats could uh, embrace. And so I think that would cause for more of a fluid approach to uh, my position as an assembly person. Uh, if it was more Republican heavy, then there are other things that I would prioritize knowing what the makeup is. I think you got to look at it like a chess game. It's really hard to tell what the approach would be until you're in there, until you see the balance of power. And depending upon that balance of power, I think you make moves that could help to uh, make certain bills move in a more fluid fashion, as opposed to choosing things that you know are going to be a big uphill battle and cause a lot of you know discord and that sort of thing. Okay, with that, that's going to conclude the question and answer period. I'm sorry that we're rushing you guys. We have a lot of assembly uh, races uh, this afternoon. Uh, so each one of you will get a minute for closing. Uh, will, I'll start with you. Uh, please make sure you look uh, directly into the camera. And please make sure you give out your uh, uh, campaign contact information as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me in this interview. It's an honor to be a part of this. I am Will Rucker, running for State Assembly in District 13. My website is electwillrucker.com. That's electwillrucker. It's Rucker like trucker without the T. I believe in a Nevada that works for all of us. I think that it's possible. I think we should do better. I think we will do better if we simply have the courage to do so. This is a new era and we need to embrace change. We need to embrace progress if we are to even survive, let alone thrive as a species. So it's time out for partisan politics and it's time in for compassion and collaboration. I can get this job done because I'm experienced, I'm effective and I'm engaged and there's no one else on the ballot for Assembly District 13 that has the type of connections working directly with the EPA, the school district, the health district and government that I have that can move Nevada forward in the direction that serves us all. Thank you. Ben? Uh, yes, my name is Van Miller, and uh, as I was saying in the beginning, I'm running for office because I think we are fundamentally at a really bad place in our history right now. Our uh, 
freedom of speech, medical freedoms, including our uh, freedom to vote, have our votes be counted. There, We have such fundamental issues as a state and as a country that I feel like first and foremost, we need uh, a new class of politician out there uh, in order to take us back onto the rails, to get back to our constitutional values, all of which has been sacrificed these this last few years and really get this nation back to where it was because none of our constitutional uh, amendments are being respected. We have due process issues, our second amendments being whittled down to nothing. Uh, we have no freedom of speech. We have no medical freedom. So that's a reason why I decided to run because with my background as an investigative journalist, I feel like I could be a different kind of force within the assembly to not only show audiovisual evidence of why some of these issues are absolutely destructive to our state and country, but to then be able to uh, take it to the next level by really pushing the agendas that are American values, constitutional values, and, and really get this uh, train back on its track. My website is vem2022.org, and all my contact info is on there, and I look for your support. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. And with that, that will conclude our endorsement interview for Nevada State Assembly District 13. Thank you.